Romans chapter number 6 tonight, Romans chapter number 6. And of course, over the last two Wednesdays, we have looked at some terms and uh, terminology that, that are related to salvation. And I say related, and I think it's very important you understand that when I use the word related, because uh, understand that when we think about justification and right or righteousness, if uh, we were to put a stop right after we got righteousness from the Lord Jesus Christ, then and stopped everything after that, we would not be saved. Okay, and uh, because. Salvation was something God did by His grace based upon what took place with, uh, you know, our righteousness and our believing the gospel. So I use the word related because as we see things, everything happens instantaneously. But there are things going on behind the scenes. And I use the analogy of starting a car. Uh, You don't see everything that's taking place inside underneath the hood. You just know what happens? And all you have to do is push the button or turn the key and everything starts up. And uh, so anyhow, this week I want to begin, I just kind of want to break down justification a little bit and just, I want to identify two components of justification. And and we're going to look at two different things tonight. And uh, when one is justified, you're going to understand that it begins with what we would refer to as remission. And basically, a payment is made, if you will, and of course, it ends with forgiveness. And a forgiveness is basically a clearing of a debt or a clearing of an account. So tonight, we want to take a look at those two, and we're going to start with remission. And the term remission simply refers to the act of remitting. Okay, to remit something is to submit or to send a payment. And, uh, and the reality of it is, is it's still quite common in use today. Uh, if you get bills in the mail, maybe you get a phone bill or a, uh, an electricity bill, maybe a, a gas bill or some other sort of bill. Uh, you know, you, you might have a, you know, pay this amount, and, and, you know, and it might say remit payment to. And it'll give you stru- instructions on how to remit payment. And uh, so you've probably seen phrases like that on bills in your time. And, you know, as we read through the scriptures, uh, you know, I I want you to recognize that sin had an effect on mankind. If you're in Romans chapter 6, I want you to look at verse number 23. And I just want you to look at the first phrase there of Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. And when you see uh, an expression like that, you understand that, you know, there's a wage for sin. There's a payment that has to be made. Uh, There's an amount owing because of sin. And of course, that debt is what? It's death. That's what the Bible reads. If you look back at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, notice what the Bible says. It says, uh, sorry, I'm in verse number, chapter 6, chapter 5, verse number 12. It says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and then notice what it says after that, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Uh, We understand that because of sin, death is part of that payment, part of that price. It's something that is owed. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, look what was told to Adam in verse number 17 of Genesis chapter 2. It says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, what does it say? Thou shalt surely die. 
Okay, we see death being part of that. We'll look over at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I think many of you probably have this verse memorized. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27. The Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die. So we understand as we look through scriptures that sin carries a debt. Sin carries a burden. Okay? It carries a price, if you will. Uh, you know, God had said that if they were to eat of the tree of the, the, the knowledge of good and evil, that they shall surely die. We see in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. We saw that uh, when Adam sinned, that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So uh, sin carries a debt. It carries a heavy burden. In fact, look what David described it as in Psalm 38. In Psalm 38. In Psalm 38, verse number 4. The Bible reads, For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. And the reality of it is, is that is what the burden of sin is. It's something that is way too heavy for us. It's something that is uh, far more taxing. It's just we do not have the shoulders to bear that sin. You know, there's an excellent parable in Matthew chapter 18. And of course, many of you probably know this parable in Matthew chapter 18, but I often call it the parable of the unjust steward. And of course, it's all brought on, and the parable is brought up uh, by Peter asking the Lord a question. In verse 21, he says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And then notice how it continues in verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when, or sorry, that's not the, the, the one I'm looking for. Uh, my mistake. Yeah, this is the right one. 24, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and notice what the Bible says there in verse 27, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant, uh, the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. But what I want you to notice is that as you look at that principle and you look at the question that Peter asked, we understand that uh, there's a debt that had to be paid that Jesus is illustrating there. And we understand that sin carries within it a penalty that demands to be paid. It has to be paid. And this is where the term remission comes into the picture. Okay, you think about Romans 6.23, where it says the wages of sin is death. And then you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3, where it speaks of how Christ died for us. Okay? When what Christ did was take was took care of the payment due for our sin by taking the payment upon himself. He made the payment for us. Okay? In fact, the first place we see the word remission in the Bible is in Matthew 26, verse 28. Look at Matthew 26, verse number 28. It says, therefore, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for 
the remission of sins. Of course, Jesus here was observing the Passover with his disciples, and he mentioned the importance of his blood for the remission of sins. Uh, head over to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 22. Notice what it says about the law. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And then look what it says in the next phrase. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So in order for sins to be paid, blood had to be shed. Now, why would blood have to be shed? Under the law, why would blood have to be shed? Okay, look back at Leviticus 17. Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus 17, and look at verse number 11. The Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now notice how it says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when blood is shed, that shows that life is on its way out. And the absence of life is what? Death. Death. The payment of sin is death. It requires death. And of course, it's signified by the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, under the law, sins were paid for based on the, the shed blood of an animal sacrifice. That animal served as a substitutionary payment for the worshiper's sin. Okay, you can take a look at some examples, but you can go anywhere from Leviticus chapter 4 to Leviticus chapter 6, and you can see all this transpire and see those offerings and how they were to work. And uh, look over at Leviticus 4. We'll, we'll just take a quick look at Leviticus chapter 4. And I'm just going to give you one example here in verse 22. Levit Leviticus 4, verse 22. And it says, when a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty. Or if his sin wherein he has sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. And she, he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a, it is a sin offering. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar as the fat uh, of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make, notice what the Bible says, make an atonement for him as concerning his sin. And I want you to notice that word atonement because that is probably the closest Old Testament equivalent of the word remission. And the word means to make reparation, reparations. It's paying the penalty for the wrong that is done. So we know the wages of sin is death. So in order for that sin to be paid for, there has to be death. And that death is signified by the shedding of one's blood. Uh, in the process here that we saw in Leviticus, we understand that the guilty would bring the sacrifice and uh, uh, before the altar, he would slay it. And that sacrifice would be the atonement or payment in the place of him, the guilty. So payment would still be made. It's just he would not have to make the payment with his own life. So. And of course, we see how this plays out with our Savior, Jesus Christ. As I read earlier in Matthew 26, how it refers to uh, the New Testament and his blood, or the blood of his, the, the New Testament. Uh, think about this. Who was responsible for slaying Christ? What? Israel. In fact, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 36. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 26, 36, sorry. I mean, there was a bunch that had a part in it, but look what how Peter says it in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, and then notice what he says, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse number 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of who? Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and then notice what he says, whom ye crucified. Okay? Now look at Acts chapter 5, and verse number 30. Acts chapter 5, verse number 30. It says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Now, this is what I find interesting. It's just this wonderful account of the scriptures. Israel didn't even know it, but they were the ones that slew their own sacrifice at the altar. And it is amazing how God does this and works all this out. In fact, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 13, look at Hebrews chapter 13. We see that it's even called an altar. In Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse number 10. It says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Uh, Jesus' death is what pays the price that sin has brought. So the death of Jesus Christ is that payment that's sufficient for (coughs) the wages of sin. And of course, this is illustrated in Romans chapter 3. If you head over to Romans chapter 3, notice what the Bible reads in verse 25. It says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare, notice what it says, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. So basically, what Jesus did on the cross, his death on the cross, is what made the payment for all the sins of our past. So when one comes to believe the gospel, immediately there's a remission based upon the death of Christ because that is what the wages of sin is. It's a death. So someone has to make that payment. And that's where Jesus comes in. Okay? So that first term is remission. But the second thing I want you to consider is the term forgiveness. I want you to head back to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter number 50. But the second term that is involved with our justification is the word forgiveness. If you were to look at a dictionary, you might see a definition, something like this, to pardon, to remit as an offense or a debt, to overlook an offense and treat the offender as not guilty. Uh, I've also seen a definition like this. It means to relieve someone of the payment of a debt. Okay? Uh, Notice some of the uses here. As we look at Genesis 50, verse 17, uh, this is the first time it shows up in the Scriptures. Look what it says in verse 17. So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they, they did unto thee evil. Now, you're going to notice this pattern. I'm going to take you through a few scriptures. And you're going to notice that when you see forgiveness, uh, you're going to see something common with forgiveness. Okay, look at Leviticus 4. We were just there a bit ago, but Leviticus chapter 4. And look at verse number 2. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not be done and shall do against any of them, 
Okay, and then it goes through a bunch of things that they have to, that has to be accomplished. Skip down to verse number 20. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them. And it shall be what? Forgiven them. Okay. Uh, I, I showed you Matthew chapter 18 earlier. Matthew chapter 18. Head back to Matthew chapter 18. And of course, a question that Peter asked the Lord in Matthew chapter 18. And he asked that question in verse 21. He says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. And then, of course, over to Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. Now, you need to understand that the word forgive shows up over a hundred times in the scriptures. And I don't have time to go through each and every verse. But I just wanted to show you a pattern that's that's relevant in the scriptures. In Romans chapter 4, verse number 7, it says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So we see kind of a common thing with those examples, don't we? Before there could be any forgiveness, there has to be sin. There has to be some sort of trespass, some sort of iniquity. And in fact, you're going to find that the necessity of forgiveness is produced by the presence of a sin or a trespass. Now, I, this isn't part of the, the lesson tonight, but you know, I've often said this. One of the, the strangest things that happened today in Christianity is where a Christian goes to God to obtain forgiveness. Okay, the reason why that's odd is because if there's sin that needs forgiven, then the person can't be saved. Right. Uh, and number two, we understand that when we were reconciled, God stopped imputing sin. So because we have no sin as far as God's concerned, there is no forgiveness that is required. But anyhow, when one forgives someone, he is addressing the presence of a sin, an offense or a trespass. And we've already seen from Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that there is a wage for sin. That implies there is a debt that is owed. Okay? The lost man, the man born of Adam, has a debt that needs to be paid. Now, when remission was made based upon the death of Jesus Christ, what did that do? Well, it allowed the sinner to be relieved from the payment of that debt that he owed. Okay, so that debt that he owed, that payment that was required, was lifted. Okay, uh, maybe you have a car loan or a mortgage. And of course, uh, when you make that last payment or when it gets paid off, guess what? You're relieved from under the obligations of those payments. And that is exactly what happened. When Jesus paid the price for our sins, that allowed that debt to be forgiven. In fact, I had mentioned it, uh, it with that parable in Matthew 8, 18, verse 21, but uh, basically it was an illustration of a debt being forgiven. And that's really what it's all about. So when we think about justification, when one is justif justified or when one is made righteous, there's really a couple things that take place that are important. There's other things that are going on, and we're going to talk about some of those things uh, next week. But number one, a payment had to be made. That is the remission. Okay? And that remission was the death of Jesus Christ. He made that payment and he offered that payment to us. And then, of course, once that payment was made, the debt was taken off the books. Okay, that debt was forgiven. So basically, we are no longer under that obligation to pay what was due. And since the debt has been paid and the wages owing forgiven, the believer is no longer in a state of unrighteousness, but righteousness. 
and he has been justified because the debt's been paid. And you know, that's why we use expressions like paid in full, or we sing songs like Jesus paid it all. He made that remission for us. And because he made that remission, we were forgiven. And of course, being forgiven of that debt, uh, that brought us from a state of unrighteousness to a state of righteousness, which is justification. But one thing I want you to understand, that forgiveness is not justification. Okay? Remission is not justification. Uh, Justification is not righteousness. Right? And salvation is not any of those things. And what you want to watch for is because people will want to interchange them and put them all and, and make them all one thing. And you got to watch that because it's not the same. It's related. You know, there's connections, but they're not speaking of the same thing. So we're going to stop there tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. And then if there's any questions, we can take those. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your word, and I pray that you would give us wisdom, give us understanding. Help us as we continue to look at these terms and uh, just to kind of get an understanding of how these things fit in uh, when we got saved. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.